Okay. Look, thanks for coming out today, guys. It's, it's great to be here. I love these events um, that are put on by RAS. We've been doing them for a number of years now, and it's, it really puts everyone that comes out today and sits through these sessions, it really puts you on the front foot. Um, they're an invaluable investment for you from a knowledge point of view. Um, and I just I highly commend RAS for putting it all together. Um, and it's a great turnout again. So um, a little bit on my background. So I've been in the industry for probably um, over 10 years now. Uh, we've got an office up in on the Sunshine Coast in Noosa uh, and also one in Brisbane. So um, my other partner, John Seaman, he does um, Sunshine Coast and Upwards and basically I look after Brisbane and the Gold Coast. Um, so let's have a look at what we're looking at today. So today we're focusing on an accountant's role, okay? Um, Frank and Mike and all those guys have given you a really good overview of what management rights is, what's involved and all that sort of stuff. Frank's going to come back again and talk about some, some incontricies in, in, in of the, um, the legal side of things. Um, so I'm just going to really focus on um, the purchase process for you and what's involved from an accountant's point of view. Okay, um, Understanding this, the role that specialist advisors have in that process and understanding our role as accountants in the process as well okay so this is a just quickly go through the buying process and then i'm going to come back and talk to you about the the, the red parts that i've highlighted on the way through so um first and foremost you need to engage um your broker okay to find the complex and hopefully raz can help you out with that Secondly, you're going to need to appoint your professional. So you're going to need to talk to a solicitor, you're going to need to talk to your accountants, you're going to need to talk to your finance brokers. Okay? Um, once you've found a complex that you're interested in, you're going to need to sign an offer and acceptance. All right, so agree to a price. Um, after that, we're going to talk about, so you're going to need to talk to your accountant about your structure. So how are you going to buy the management rights? How are you going to buy the business? And then how are you going to buy the unit if there is real estate involved? Um, after that's complete and signed off, then you can look at signing contracts. Um, we look at, after that, we've generally got 14 days to do the income verification, that's prepared by us. Once that's all cleared, generally then you've got legal due deal, um, finance acceptance, and then you've got an unconditional contract and congratulations, you've just bought a management rights. So we're gonna um, have a look at the appointment of the professionals, okay? So um, why it's so important to use the specialists, okay, and everybody, if there's one consistent message that you'll hear today, is that um, use specialists, okay. Um, if I've got the perfect example, I did it last week. We had um, an accountant who I was going out to do a verification, account, the vendor's accountant provided me with, with a P&L for sale that they're prepared. Now, as soon as I looked at it, I'd never heard of this accountant, um, so that's always a good indication. Um, because it's a very tight community that we work in in the management rights industry. Um, but there were things in there that I knew as soon as I looked at it we were going to have issues. There was GST included on the income for the body corporate salary um, because they thought it was just a salary so there's no GST on salaries. Well it's not, it's a contract payment so there's always GST. Um, so there was depreciation in there, there was interest from the loans, there was wages, there was all sorts of things that was wrong. Now it came up that it was about $50,000 short. Okay. So, huge amount of effort's gone into that deal. The people purchasing have paid my fees, they've paid some legal fees, they've gone through the whole process and now we've, we've knocked the deal on the head because it hasn't stacked up. So now, if they want to purchase more management rights, they've got to go through the whole process. But it's also wasted the vendor's time because they, they, they've gone through this process as well and they're not going to get a sale, okay? So, I guess, by using specialists, we hopefully avoid that and we make this transition smooth um, from start to finish. Um, so solicitors generally involved probably the most as well as your brokers through the whole process. Um, they, they'll hold your hand the whole way. They're involved from start to finish contract all the way through to settlement. Um, from an accounting perspective, we tend to be heavily involved at the start. Um, then we won't do a, a lot. There'll be a bit of advice on the way through the contract process and then we'll get ag involved again once it's unconditional and, and you're in the complex. So we have a bit of a staggered approach whereas the, the solicitors um, and the, uh, the, the brokers will be heavily involved all the way through with you. 
Um, so finance specialist, again, um, talk to Damien or, the, or, or, or some of the other brokers in the industry. Um, they can help you out there and, and you will get the best deal and the best advice um, from all those guys. Uh, and then accountant, as I just said, um, very important to use uh, the right accountant um, for the industry. So, um, look, uh, in terms of business structuring, so once you've got your, your offer accepted, okay, so we look at business structuring. So how are you going to buy the complex? How are you going to buy the business? And how are you going to buy the unit? Um, so the reason that we do this now is that we have to set it up right at the start because it's very difficult to change once, uh, once it's in place and it can be very costly to change in the future as well from a tax point of view, from a stamp duty point of view. So we need to get it right from the start and there's no one fit for everyone. Okay? So everyone might be different because of your circumstances. So we have a look at this with you. Um, I'd normally be over at the whiteboard and um, saying a lot of things, but I've drawn that up so everyone can have a look at that, um, and we'll talk about the types of structures now and what, what, um, what we use. So in most cases, um, common types, sole traded partnership companies and trusts. So in the majority of um, management rights, you're looking at a combination of companies and trusts, um, or a trust by itself or a company by itself. So. I'll talk quickly about the advantages and disadvantages and how it works and why we do it, um, and then what is most commonly used in the industry. So from a company's point of view, sorry, take a step back. So from a structuring point of view, the first thing that we look at is risk, okay? So we want to make sure that um, we separate the business from you um, individually from a risk point of view, so that if anything happens in the business, okay, anything goes wrong, um, you're covered from an individual point of view and from your personal side of things, so family, assets, all that sort of stuff, as best we possibly can. Okay? Um, and generally, the way we do that is through the use of companies. Okay? And the reason we use companies um, is because companies have directors, okay? so you have to have individuals who are directors of the company and they're responsible for running the company. So you can see those over there. Um, now, there's something in companies called limited liability. So limited liability essentially means that you are separate from the business and the company, okay? And you can't be held personally responsible for anything that happens in the business, okay? So if anything goes wrong, okay, in the business, look, not that it hopefully would, touch wood, um, but if anything happens in the business, and management rights is a very, generally very safe business, as a lot of the guys have already said, um, we're protecting you from a personal point of view as best we can, okay, from exposure. Um, so it has limited liabilities, all right? Um, it, they, they're also shareholders, so directors and shareholders are generally in small business the same people, okay, but they can be other um, entities as well if we need to from a tax point of view, we can structure it. Um, now, 30 cents in the dollar, flat rate, as soon as you earn a dollar of profit, you pay 30 cents tax, okay? So from a tax point of view, which is the second point we take into consideration when we're structuring, okay, companies are very rigid, all right? There's not much flexibility there. There's only two ways you can get money out of a company, so you can either take it out in wages or you can take it out in dividends, okay? They're the only two ways to get it out. There's no, the ATO cracked down on loans and things like that now that people used to be taking out and not paying tax on. So there's, it's, it's very inflexible from a tax point of view. Okay? However, if we're talking about very large complexes or very large levels of income, it can be a benefit because with that rigid tax, it gives you a cap of tax as well. Okay? So you're capped at 30 cents. So if you're earning high levels of income, whereas on an individual rate, you'd, your sliding scale would increase to above 30 cents in a dollar with a company, it's capped at 30 cents. So if we're talking about large, com large complexes, large levels of income, then we might consider companies, okay? Now, in terms of trusts, okay, which is another entity that we can use, um, similar to companies, trusts have um, someone that has to be responsible for them or running them. So, and that's a trustee in this case, okay? Now, um, with trusts and trustees, they're a little bit different to a director, okay? Trusts can be individual people, okay, like they are in companies. Sorry, trustees can be individual people. However, they can also be companies, all right? So whenever we're setting up a business in a trust, 
okay, we generally use a company as the trustee, all right? And what that does is it brings limited liability back into consideration, okay? So again, we've separated you from the business as best we can from a structuring point of view for the use of the company and the limited liability, okay? However, with a company, sorry, with a trust comes some greater flexibility from a tax point of view, okay? So from a tax point of view, a trust doesn't pay tax, okay? A trust is dis a trust profit is distributed out to other beneficiaries, okay? So as you can see in the drawing, it can go out to other individuals, okay, and paid at that tax rate. It can go to other companies and paid at the 30 cents in the dollar, or it can go to another trust and then be paid out from that trust again, all right? So it gives you much better flexibility to be able to utilise your individual tax rates, which, are, which can be lower than the 30 cents in the dollar, okay, to give you a better tax result in the long run, all right? The other advantage from a tax point of view in the trust is that it gets access to um, the 50 cent discount, okay, from a capital gains point of view, which is a very um, high consideration in management rights because management rights is, is a generally a high turnover type of business. You buy it, you're in it for four or five years, you sell it, you go into another one, you buy that one, you're in it for four or five years, you sell it, you go into another one. So um, there's all sort of advantages as well from a capital gains point of view in a trust um, that's better. So um, structuring, very important, okay? Um, so if I go to the next one, Mike, your computer's died again. Um, so there's your corporate trustee structure, okay? So you've got the trust with the company on top, all right, and your advantages, which we've talked about. One of the disadvantages is it's obviously also, you know, costlier to set up because you've got to set two entities up. Um, also from a licensing point of view, you have to have two licenses. You have to have a company license and an individual license. But generally what you'll find is those costs are outweighed by the benefits you get from a tax and risk point of view. Okay. Um, so like I said, choice of structure is going to depend on your own circumstances. It's wide and varied. Um, majority of management rights in the industry would be owned in the um, trust with a corporate trustee. Um, structure, um, but that, like I said, everybody's different, so you need to get your own advice on what's right for you. Um, so then we come to the income verification sort of thing. So this is where um, contracts have been signed. We've got 14 days. You engage myself or another specialist management rights accountant to go into the complex and work out what's going on, and if that P and L that they've provided you is correct. Um, so we have a thorough review of all the income. So we go through all the um, trust account software and all the trust account income, trust account bank statements to make sure that the income that they're received or that they're telling you received is correct, okay? And we flow that all the way through from receipt of income, okay, into the trust account and then through manager's check into the general account, all right? So there's a flow of funds that can be tracked fairly accurately. These accounts have to be audited three times a year as well. So in most cases, the income, unless like I illustrated before, someone's included GST on it or something like that, um, is pretty easy to determine. You know, very rarely do we have issues with the income because it's quite easy to determine. Um, we also cite the agreements between owners and managers, so the Form 6s, the 20As as they used to be called, um, and there's a number of non-financial reviews as well. So we look through, we make sure we review the letting pool and have a look at all that sort of stuff. Um, we look through the body corporate agreements. Um, we look at things like reception hours, um, whether or not you're responsible for, or like Frank was talking about, the gardening expenses or the maintaining the machinery or whatever you use, um, or that's body corporate's responsibility. So there's a few things we look at there as well um, and tie that back to a business point of view. All right. Um, uh, so we also look at the expenses. Okay, so expenses are probably where the most conjecture is because um, there's no set rate or, you know, everybody throws around that there's industry standards for a lot of things, um, which, you know, I don't really believe in too much. 
I generally work off actuals and what's actually happened. Okay, so um, there are a couple industry standards that you will see a lot. Okay, and that one is motor vehicles. So motor vehicle allowance will generally for smaller businesses be five hundred twenty dollars, um, and for the larger sort of things is a thousand and forty. Okay, um, so that'll be normally included, and that's just a, a rate that's been around for ever. Everybody uses it, and that's what the banks expect um, to be in there. Okay. Um, we'll have a look at you know accounting fees, audit fees, bank fees, all those sorts of things to make sure that they're correct and sufficient for a complex of that size, okay, uh, and that nature that we've seen before. Um, some of the things that are a bit controversial, wages, okay, is always the big one. So, like Mike said before, the, the profit that's provided to you doesn't include um, any wages for a two-person management team. Okay, so that's assumed as um, being part of that. Um, so anything required over and above that, we have to allow for additional wages in that P&L. So when we're getting to larger size complexes, um, holiday complexes where they have reception and things like that, we will need to make allowances for additional wages on top of the two person management team um, to run the complex efficiently and properly. Okay. Um, I can't think of any other. Uh, repairs and maintenance is sometimes an issue um, for one off expenses. So, if um, the manager painted the complex this year and they want to try and include that as income um, and expenses for the year, it's just not going to happen because it's a one off expense. So, we'll go through the expense side of things and the income side of things and determine if. Um, it's, it's a one-off expense, okay, so it's non-reoccurring, so that's a big thing that we look at to make sure that it's reoccurring income for you coming in to buy that you're going to get every year. Okay. Um, like we said before, any accountant's probably going to say that they can do this. Um, it doesn't mean that they can. Um, you need to use your, your, your specialist management rights accountants. Um, the other good thing is that many of the banks now will only accept the reports, which is required for all of your finance that you need to do, from a specialist management rights account that they that they accept um, or that they approve. So um, if you don't and you get someone that's not qualified to do it um, and you submit that to the bank, they'll make you do it again. So you'll pay twice, okay, with someone that they, they accept. Um, so just quickly some tips. Um, be consistent once you're in there. Do your reconciliations weekly and keep things up to date. Um, if in doubt, ask. This is a really big one. Um, the amount of people that ring me up and say, oh, Sam, I've just done this, I'm just checking if it's right, and then we can't undo it because they've already done it. So if you're going to do something or you've got questions or you've got a problem, give us a call or give Frank a call or whoever you need to talk to about it before you do it because it's a lot easier to fix something and get it sorted beforehand than it is if you've done it and try and reverse everything. Okay, so always try and talk to all your, um, your specialists as much as you can before you do anything. Um, and a, a really good one, associate with as many other managers and many other people in the industry as you can. Okay, so coming to days like this is great. Join ARAMA, join the other um, industry uh, bodies. Um, get out, so they do functions nearly every week. There's, I get so many emails, it's ridiculous. Um, that you can go out and meet all the people in the industry. And what you'll find is, in, in the majority, people in this industry are very welcoming, okay? And they'll share knowledge with everybody because very rarely do you directly compete with each other, okay? So it's very welcome and welcoming and very, um, very open um, with people. So um, a couple others that aren't up there that I'll mention quickly that I wrote down before. Uh, um, uh, get your licence as soon as possible or just do, or at least do your course. So go and see Dennis or give him a call and, and because it will give you a really good foundation of what the industry is about and what you need to know. Okay, So uh, I try and get people to get their course done as soon as they can. As soon as they start looking, get in there and get it done. gives you a foundation and understanding of what, what, what's required and what you need to know. Um, it's a people business, as Mike said. Okay, so really important that if you don't want to deal with other people's problems um, or issues or deal with people on a day-to-day -day basis, this is not the industry for you, okay? 
Um, you're going to be every single day dealing with tenants, you're going to be dealing with owners, you're going to be dealing with body corporates and committees, you're going to be dealing with their solicitors, you're going to be dealing with all different people and you're going to have to have those skills um, to be able to deal with those people efficiently um, and calmly. So if you're not a people person, maybe look at something else. Um, the other one is do a cash flow. Okay, for your new business before you do, before you're looking at it or while you're looking at it, your accountant can help you with that. We can help you with that. Um, but it's really important, especially for someone like looking at a holiday complex. Okay, so if anyone's looking for a holiday complex, really important you do a cash flow. And the reason is what you'll find with holiday complexes is occupancy goes like this. Okay, so you'll have a really condensed level of occupancy around December. Okay, December, January, holidays, and then probably one in Easter as well, okay, where your occupancy could be 9,500%. And the remainder of the year, it could be 50%. Okay, so you could be getting you know, 50, 60% of your income over three or, four, three or four months during the year. Now, if you buy in May, and you're not getting that hit of income until December, and you have all these obligations all the way through of interest and, or, and everything, that, and your loan repayments, all that sort of stuff that needs to happen. You need to be aware of, of the level of income you're going to receive through those months till you get that hit of income which is going to build up. Okay? So it's really important to plan, get your cash flow done so you know how it's going to be and you see the seasonality of the business. All right? And that can happen in, in permanent stuff as well, just to a smaller scale. So you could have um, big pest control, you know, that's done once a year, which you get every unit, and there's a big flux of income in that one month. You need to know about those sorts of things. You need to talk to your accountant about it. Okay? So um, I think that's it for me. Um, we'll do questions at the end, um, but yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, appreciate it, and talk to your industry specialists. Okay? Thank you.